Let's talk about Medi-Cal. You have a choice, and Molina makes it easy. So let's talk about making your life easier, about extra help to manage your health. Nobody knows Medi-Cal better than Molina. Visit meetmolinaca.com. Let's talk today. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. Wow. I it was that wrong. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. We have our five-year anniversary show coming up May 6th in New York City, storycollider.org for more details. This week's story is from Renee Lajek. It was recorded in April 2015 at Oberon in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The first time I looked at my skin under a microscope, I was amazed. I had stolen it, or as I like to say, creatively borrowed it from my brother. And when I looked at the skin, I saw little cells laid on top of one another. And I couldn't believe that something so mundane and boring had become incredible. I felt the same way when I first heard and understood why leaves turn red and gold and fall off the trees. Growing up in South Africa, in a part of the country that doesn't actually have seasons, I was amazed that the beautiful colors that I'd seen actually had scientific uh, reason for existing. I, as a kid, I gravitated towards trying to understand the natural world in my deep faith that anyone could be a scientist. And this is something that was supported by my teachers and my mother. In fact, my mom once told me I could be anything I wanted, as far out as an astrophysicist. Turns out she was right. But I haven't always felt this welcome and this accepted. A couple of years ago, I was contacted by a US special investigator. Now, as a foreigner, that's pretty scary. Um, but he was contacting me because a friend of mine had applied for a job in a national lab, and he needed to cross-check some details of when we were lab assistants together at Oxford. This had to happen in person because it was sensitive information. Now, I was very, very scared. I knew this was a really big deal, and I wanted to give her the best shot at a job. So I organized an in-person meeting, I turned my office from typical academic to spick and span and organized. And I decided I would try and be confident and professional. So I dressed in all black, got myself ready, and I was ready for the moment of truth. He knocked on the door. I opened it. We started to shake hands and exchange pleasantries. And then everything went downhill. As he pulled his hand away, he laughed and looked at me and said, oh, <laughs> You're too pretty to be a scientist. I thought you'd have your hair in a bun and be wearing glasses. So, kind of like now, the blood just rushed for away from my face and I felt sick. I didn't know what to do because here was this man in a position of power over me and my friend and her job potentially relied on me being accurate and careful with the, with the facts. I wanted to send daggers at him through my unglassed eyes, but I sat down, finished the interview, and was polite, and he left the room. As any contemporary scientist, of course I blogged about it, <laughs> as you should, because I wanted to try and communicate just why what he did was unprofessional and why it made me angry. And partly I knew I would have to cut off at the past the typical things that I know I would hear. To paraphrase a colleague of mine, actually, oh, you ladies want us to say nice things, but then when you do, we get upset. So before anyone says that he was trying to be nice and give me a compliment, he actually wasn't. He was doing two things. The first is he was saying relative to some other group, he thought I was attractive, and he thought it was okay to tell me that. The second thing that he was saying is that there was a box and a stereotype that I didn't fit into, and it was okay to highlight that. Now, if we forget that it was unprofessional for a second, and that he actually was trying to compliment me, he could have said something like, I like your dress, or wow, you have crazy hair, or whatever. But why were we talking about bodies? These were two professionals meeting to discuss an academic colleague. There was no reason to have any of this discussion. After he left, it took me a couple of days to calm down. But I thought about this in the context of my life in general. And I'm ashamed to say that this wasn't an isolated incident. I was kind of confused as to how this had happened many times. 
This July is my ninth anniversary of giving a professional science talk. I was a scared undergrad, really nervous, and about to give a talk at the South African Institute of Physics conference. It was a cold July morning. I know that that's weird, but it was a cold July morning. <laughs> and I decided I wanted to give a good talk, so I did what I normally do. I dressed in all black, pants and a top, but I wanted to bring some of my creativity, so I wore a bright pink scarf. I did the talk, I didn't mess it up, I answered questions thoughtfully, which is really hard when you're starting out, and I felt really good about myself. So I was relaxing at the coffee stand, trying to debrief myself, and a postdoc came up to me and said, no one's going to listen to you if you dress like that. You're distracting everyone with that scarf. Now, okay, it was a bright scarf, but I didn't realize that there were these unwritten rules about what I could and couldn't wear. I was dressed modest, modestly. There wasn't any show of skin. And I felt really disheartened because here I was trying to do my best and be a confident scientist, and there was this unwritten rule about what I could and couldn't wear. I decided to speak to some of my mentors, as you do, and while they admitted that it was probably inappropriate for him to talk to me like that, they told me that if I didn't want this to happen again, I should probably realize that people were going to judge me based on what I was wearing. One mentor suggested to give a great talk and feel good at the end, maybe I should dress like I was going to a funeral. I was really, really frustrated. And I took the decision then and there that I wanted to dress the way I wanted to dress. I wanted to use color, I wanted to paint my nails and wear makeup, and that there would be consequences, and I accepted that. I didn't realize just how right I would be. A couple of years later, I was a graduate student at Oxford, sitting around after a colloquium with a bunch of colleagues, uh, and one postdoc, it's always postdocs, anyway. <laughs> one postdoc looked at me and they said, um, so who exactly did you have to sleep to, with to get to where you are? So I got really angry, and I yelled at him, because I'm that kind of girl. And when I shouted and said, like, what the hell are you talking about? He said to me, well, you wear high heel shoes and skirts at work. That's clear what you're asking for. As I am now moving up in my career, I'm able to mentor undergrads and graduate students. And I want them to come through the academic system unscathed. So what I should probably do is tell them that they should dress conservatively, not wear a lot of color, and just fit the mold. But I'm not going to do that. Instead, what I tell them is that, yes, people might comment if you paint your nails. I've overheard colleagues say, if you can match your nails to your dress and apparently the curtains, um, <laughs> you're not spending enough time thinking about science. But what I do tell them is that scientists come in all shapes and sizes. They have different numbers of tattoos, different skin colors, different accents, and that's okay. That their science shouldn't be judged just by how they sound or what they wear. But it's hard, right? Everyone is biased. I was in a talk very recently, and a guy came in the room to give the talk. And when I first looked at him, I thought he had the body more of what I would associate with a bodybuilder than a scientist. But you know what I did with that information? I filed it under, oh, that's cool, kept my mouth shut, didn't embarrass him, and listened to the science coming out of his mouth. What do we do about the way that scientists are perceived in the media? Why is it that still Articles are written about scientists, often female, in terms of their attractiveness or their marital status or their family life. Why can't we lead with the science? I'm a cosmologist, and so I study the initial conditions of the universe, and in particular, how they form and grow under gravity to form all the structures that we see around us. Galaxies, clusters of galaxies, you and me. I know that if the initial conditions are different, the final universe that we get, once gravity has its way, is very, very different. But what about the initial conditions of the scientific community themselves? I worry that if we don't start having conversations about who, who are scientists and what they need to look or dress like, we'll be robbing ourselves of a future generation of bright, creative minds who feel like they don't fit the mold. In my formative years, I was supported and told that if I worked hard, was creative, and I put in the hours, I could be part of the scientific community. But it's actually hard to remain grounded in that when these things come up time and time again. This is why I think it's really important when I give talks to the public, or when I speak to undergrads, or when I speak to professors, that I no longer hide my tattoos, and I don't care that my hair's a funny color or I have a nose ring. Because those things make me Renee, but science makes me a scientist.
that was Rene Lajek. Rene is the Lyman Spitzer Jr. Postdoctoral Fellow in Theoretical Astrophysics at Princeton University. The Spitzer Costin Fellow in the Princeton Society of Fellows in the Liberal Arts and is currently a senior TED Fellow. Her research focuses on theoretical cosmology. As a member of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, she measures the cosmic microwave background radiation to decipher the initial conditions of the universe. When not investigating the cosmos, she loves to sing loudly, read, and bake. For more science stories, take a look at storyclatter.org. We have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Evelith. Just love from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Oberon for hosting the show, and to people of all kinds from all places who do science. Thanks for listening. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.